Hey, good morning, everyone. Wonderful to uh, to be with you all again uh, today as we worship. Uh, man, I hope you guys enjoyed the service last week. What a great response we had, and uh, we are excited to to worship with you guys again today. So, uh, man, I really hope that you'll sing along with us and uh, and praise God with us this morning. Open up the gates.
Isn't he wonderful? Sing alleluia. Christ is risen. Bow down before him. For he is Lord of all. Sing alleluia. Jesus, thank you for, for allowing us to worship you. God, no matter where we may be today, sitting on the couch, sitting in bed, God, wherever we may be, thank you for the gift of worship, the opportunity to sing these praises to a God who is so wonderful. God, we sing hallelujah. We give praise and we give thanks for you are risen. Sing, oh, what a savior.
down before down before him for he is Lord of all sing hallelujah Christ is risen come on and praise him wherever you are this morning give him praise shout his name to all the earth Jesus, we love you so much. We love you so much. Thank you for this time to worship you and everything that you are. And we all said together in one voice, amen. God bless you. Turn around, greet your neighbor, no matter how many there are with you this morning. Good morning, boys and girls. I'm missing seeing your beautiful faces this morning, but I was thinking about you guys this week. And I thought about how different your world is that you guys are being homeschooled now, how different it is for you guys as well as mom and dad. And I think it's very interesting that the last month, this whole month of March, we've been talking about forgiveness. And with you guys being home so much, I think Jesus is going to be giving you a lot of chances to ask for forgiveness as well as mom and dad. Last week we talked about that everybody needs forgiveness. You guys are gonna need forgiveness because I have a feeling you might be giving mom and dad a hard time about homeschool. Mom and dad are gonna need to ask for forgiveness because this is new for them and they, they might get a little frustrated and lose their temper and that's okay. Um, you guys have lots of time to practice all the things that we've learned. We talked about Everyone needs forgiveness. We talked about that sometimes we have to take that first step in forgiveness and we can't always wait for the other person. We've talked about when we forgive other people, it changes them and it changes us. But most importantly, we need to forgive because that's what Jesus did and that's what he asks us to do. So let's do a quick review of our, um, our story last week. Turn to mom or dad or brother or sister or stuffed animal or cat or dog or whoever's close to you and tell them who were the main characters in our story last week. All right, if you said dad and two brothers, you are correct. There was an older brother and a younger brother. Now tell them real quick what happened to the story. What did that younger brother do? What did he ask dad? All right, if you said he asked dad for his inheritance and he ran off and spent all his money, give yourself a pat on the back. You did it correctly, good job. But we also talked about that the younger son came home, the father forgave him, and that's where kind of our story ended, happy ending. Everyone got forgiven and everybody was happy but that's actually not where our story ends. We need to take a minute and talk about the older brother. So the older brother was out in the field. He's been working this whole time while the younger brother was out going to movies and going to dinner and spending all the money. Older brother was home working really hard. So when he walked into the field, he heard music and dancing and he could smell the barbecue going on. And he asked one of the servants, he said, What's going on? And the servant said, there's a party. Your younger brother has come home. And his father came out, and this is what the older brother said to his father. This is from Luke chapter 15, verse 29. And the older son said this to his dad. Look, for many years I have been serving you, and I have never neglected a commandment of yours, and yet you've never given me a goat so that I might celebrate with my friends. So do you think that older brother was happy that his little brother was home, or do you think he was mad? He was mad. I could hear him say this after he said that to his dad. That's not fair. I've been here working, he's been out having fun, and I don't get a party in my name? And this is what the father said to the older son. This is verse 31. Son, you've always been here for me. All that is mine is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice, for your brother is not dead. He is alive. He was lost and has now been found. So what do you think happened? Did the older brother go into the party and was he happy his little brother was home? Or did he stay outside and pout? 
Interesting, Bible doesn't tell us the answer. He doesn't tell us, doesn't tell us what the older brother does. But if we think about it for a minute, if the older brother doesn't forgive his little brother, he's missing out on the party, he's missing out on memories, he's missing out on laughter, he's missing out on the relationship with his little brother. Because when we don't forgive people, it really ends up hurting us in the end. And that's what Jesus tells us to do, that we need to forgive others so we don't miss out on relationship with him and relationships with other people. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, thank you for loving us. Thank you for showing us what true forgiveness looks like by dying on the cross. Please help us to choose forgiveness. Help us to choose forgiveness so we don't miss out on gifts, so we don't miss out on relationships, and we don't miss out on memories. Jesus, we love you. Amen. Good morning, everyone. I trust that you're doing well at home. None of you have come down with the virus. In fact, we haven't heard of anybody within our body coming down with the virus at all. So praise God. He's protecting us. Uh, we do have one birthday wish I want to throw out there. Mary Hicks is having a birthday, so if you have a chance to cross her path um, or if you want to send her a message and let her know happy birthday, we wish her happy birthday also. In addition to that, there's a few things before we take our offering that I want to make sure that you are aware of. For you kids, it's important for you to know that the worksheets that you would normally use within your classroom, they're going to be available through our website. All you need to do is have your mom and dad go to the website and download a PDF file. And so all the coloring pages, all the information pages you need will be there. So for you kids, make sure you do that. Also on the website, last week we had just the singular um, link for you to go and look at our entire service. This week also, I want you to know that we'll have a link for not just the song service. So if you want to worship during the week, you can continue to do that. Uh, we'll also have the kids' corner there, and then we'll have the entire full service. So there'll be three different links for you to pull from, whichever you guys uh, decide to do on uh, Sunday morning. I found it very interesting. Most of you dialed in to watch the service at the same time our service goes on anyway. So creatures of habit. I love it. Uh, we're going to take our offering right now, and we know that you're going to be giving it home through push pay or whatever. I need to tell you, and this is a blessing, your generosity just always amazes me. God uses you to do a whole lot. And we're reaching people, not just in the community, but um, beyond this community in the world, because of your gifts. We had the same level of offering last week for a fourth week in a month that we normally have for a fourth week in a month. So praise God. He's taking care of us. There's provision. This is the fifth week. And if you're going to be giving on home by push pay, we've gone through how to do that before. If you need any help, all you have to do is text or email one of us on staff or call us. Uh, if you need any help with anything regarding giving, you can call Heather or any of the staff, and we'd be glad to help you with that. Let's have a word of prayer for our offering. Father, we thank you. We give you praise. We know that no matter what goes on in this world, you are in charge. We don't have to worry. We don't have to fear. The anxieties that creep up on us because we're afraid we'll get ill or we'll mix with people and we'll have something that's going to happen to us. Father, we pray thanking you that when we fear you, when we are in awe of you, there's no fear in this world that we need to possess. We thank you for sending us peace. I thank you, Father, for the faithfulness of everybody within First Baptist, and we thank you that that's going to continue by the power of your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey everyone, and we're handling this just like regular church. Another shout out for a birthday, Jennifer Lopez, well done. Julia Gooley, actually, uh, Jen's daughter. And so, Julia, well done. Happy birthday to you. And we're going to continue our sermon series. We're going to be wrapping up in a couple weeks, uh, the first Samuel. And so, would you please pray with me as we begin? Heavenly Father, Lord, again, we recognize it's your spirit that, again, moves us and grows us and convicts us and just comforts us. And so, Lord, we just ask that your Holy Spirit give us eyes to see and ears to hear what you have to tell us today. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. For some of us, we grew up in the time when a modern American classic to cinema where we were blessed with, and that movie, that comedy masterpiece of Tommy Boy, 
For those that remember that movie growing up, you couldn't go into a conversation without quoting a line. Everyone remembers the scene. It doesn't, does, does it hurt right here? Not right here so much, not right here, but right about here. And everyone would quote it and they would talk about it. They would say, hey, is there a niner in there? Or did you eat a lot of paint chips as a kid? But I think most of us would be really surprised that there's a biblical principle in Tommy Boy, most of us were like, hey, we check out our brain and we're not really paying attention, but I want to draw your attention to this scene where Tommy Boy is in the diner. He's talking to his friend. He looks at the waitress and he goes, hey, we're both in sales. You want to know how I relate and how I deal with sales? He goes, this represents my sale. And he grabs a roll, holds it, and he goes, this is my sale. I love it. And I pet it. And he goes, and I hold it, and I hug it, and it's my favorite, it's my pet. And then he just squishes it like that, and he just crumbles it, and it falls in between his hands. And he goes, and he communicating to the waitress, he goes, see, that's what I do to my sales, I destroy it. I wanted it so bad that I destroy it. And the biblical principle I'm wanting you to see in Tommy Boy is this. And I think Jesus was communicating that same principle that says, when you want something so bad, you end up destroying it. And Jesus says, what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and yet forfeit his soul? And he tells us, he goes, hey, you need to lay down your life and you'll find it. But if you keep it, it's going to slip right through your fingertips. And for you see, I'm going to get read us a passage in Matthew chapter 16 and says this, Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. And whoever wishes to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what point, what will a profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? And for you see, what we're going to talk about today is we're going to look at two individuals, Saul and David. We're going to look at where Saul, where he had to have it. That means his kingdom, and he did whatever it took to make sure he had it as long as possible. And to where he said, David, where he says, I had to live up to it. And then we have a choice today to follow the, Saul's example or follow David's example. For you see, I think those questions about dry, or what driving us and how we behave today. Because Saul, as we take a look at Saul and his behavior and what he did, at certain pivotal points in his reign, in his kingdom, what he did showed us an example of what not to do. Because that is the driving force. And for a pastor, Tim Keller always mentioned it, saying it was taking a good thing and making it the ultimate thing. It was a good thing that he was placed king, but Saul made that the ultimate thing. And you can see how that kingdom easily slipped through his hands. Every time he tried to, where he says, I have to have it. Anytime he felt threatened, he was going to lose it, he would cut a corner. He would jump ahead. He wouldn't wait on the Lord. And you see, this is kind of what happens. You see this, we find it in 1 Samuel chapter 13, where it said, Samuel says to him, Saul, what have you done? And Saul said, because I saw the people were scattering from me, and that you didn't come in the appointed days. And then he says this in verse 12, so I forced myself and offered a burnt offering. So in this situation, Saul is ready to go into battle, and he's seeing his kingdom kind of flee him, and he's forcing it. He's looking at, who am I going to be without my kingdom? And he forces it, and he squishes it. And you can see the consequence of what happens for his actions. And it didn't stop there, for Saul easily could have continued and repented and saying, you know what, I'm not going to do it again. But he continued to do this. He goes, he sees this in 1 Samuel chapter 15. He goes, why then... Did you not obey the voice of the Lord, but rushed upon the spoil and did what was evil in the sight of the Lord? Here Saul was given specific instructions not to keep any of the spoils, and yet he did. And yet he allowed the men to do it. Because you can see what happens is when you have to have something, you will take a shortcut. You will lie. You will sometimes steal. And here you have a scene in the Bible, and I think this was 
Saul's last point of trying to hold on to his kingdom as long as he could. And for some of us who have read the books, Harry Potter, or have seen the movies, or have seen Star Wars, all of a sudden the Bible comes in to play because you have this weird scene at play. For those who have are Star Wars geeks, you see this happen in Endor. And for those that know, it's a return of the Jedi and a bunch of Wookiees and all of these going on, Ewoks going on, and it's the last battle, and that's where it's happening. Everyone's like, I didn't know that's where, where George Lucas got it from. He got it from the Bible, man. Check this out, because this is what happens. This is a weird story. It's like Harry Potter and Star Wars, Force Ghosts. It's all going down in this chapter, in chapter uh, 1 Samuel 20, 28, to where Saul is praying. He is seeing a Philistine army circle him, and he is thinking to himself, I'm going to lose what I love most, my kingdom. It's finally come, and I can't stop it. So he's seeking the Lord. So he's seeking the priest, and no one's giving him an answer, and he goes, forget it. I'm going to try it. I'm going to go to a medium, and maybe she will conjure up Samuel, who has recently passed away. And sure enough, he goes there, and Samuel does show up like a force ghost. And then what happens? Samuel gives him the exact same words he gave them before. It was the answer he was running away from. It was the answer he didn't want. And this is what Samuel said. The Lord has done accordingly as he spoke through me. For the Lord has torn the kingdom out of your hand and has given it to your neighbor, to David. And finally, we see the actions of where someone who says, when they are drive, being driven by the idea of saying, how long can I have it? What do I need to do to preserve it? And you're looking after shortcut after shortcut. And when you have that philosophy and that mentality, what is going on is you will cheat, you will steal, you will lie to keep it as long as humanly possible because you have made that thing the center of your life and you can't possibly think of what life will be without it and you would rather die. And here, that was the answer for Saul. And you can see this done in in real life. You've seen it where relationships go south so fast to where someone is in a relationship and they make that person the main principle, the main purpose for their leaving, and all of a sudden a healthy relationship becomes toxic because that person is now possessive, and you've seen that happen. They're jealous, and the relationship they crave and they want so much, what did they do? They squish it, and it literally falls through their hands, and that person says, hey, I can't be around you anymore. You're not safe from me. And that's what happens when we make a good thing turn it into the ultimate thing. And that's what Saul did. And those are the words that happened. But here's what I want you to see. It's not about having it. It's about living up to it. And it's about living up to it to receive David is where he gave us a good example to follow. It wasn't about having to have it because David could have had it in, in time to almost Two times he could have had the kingdom just like that because God delivered Saul into his area. And so Saul was jealous of David. David used to play the harp for Saul. And what happened was David felt threatened, was there, and he was above reproach. Saul felt threatened, even tried to spear David a couple times, throwing a spear at him. And and David's like, hey, I got to run. I got to go to the En Gedi. And where God literally led David into hiding and he was protected and Saul's trying to get there and you can see he's like I'm almost going to get there and then Dave, David is hiding in a cave he's hiding in a cave and this is what happens he says listen he goes he's seen Saul come into a cave and he goes I could easily take him and take his life but I will not I will not lift up a hand on the anointed and so he literally cuts a cloth, a little, uh, a, a little swatch out of his robe and showing Saul. It's like, Saul, I could have easily ended this fight, but I didn't want to. And it was more about living up to what it meant to be a king rather than having to have it. He's like, I know I'm anointed, but not in, God, in my time, in the Lord's time. 
And you see what happened is, and again, David was hiding from Saul, and there he is in the wilderness, and David is trying to approach his neighbor for helping, for helping. And what happened here is like he sent about 10 messengers over to his neighbor. He's like saying, hey, by the way, I've been looking after your flock. Is there any way that you can compensate us? And it's not anything I'm asking exorbitant. It's just hospitality between neighbors. Hey, is there any way you can do that? And what happens is this guy just goes south on him. He's like, get out of here. What are you doing this? And insults David. David hears the word back from his messengers. And what happens there, David is frustrated. He is mad. He is, he felt like going, I got to right this wrong. And so he does. So he gets all his guys who are there with him going down back to this guy that insulted him. And that guy's wife cuts David off and appeals to David. And appeals to David and saying, hey, we've wronged you, David. Would you listen to the voice of reason? And she even appeals to saying, David, what you're about to do is going to leave a lasting stain on your kingdom. And as a king, don't do it. And now here David has a choice. Do I care more about my reputation or do I care about living up? to the standard of what God has called me to do. And he decides to have mercy on that individual. And you can see that again. And now all of a sudden, again, David is put in a similar situation to where Saul is still pursuing David after David spared his life. And now Saul is there. David is there. He looks down. He's watching them. And they go to sleep. David goes into the camp while they're sleeping. Saul has a spear and a jug. There he is sleeping. I could end this again. And I can take the kingdom. People will rally around me. It's finally over. And David goes, no, it's not about having to have it. It's about living up to it. So he takes a step back and he allows Saul to live. And he shows him the spear and the jug. He's saying, listen, I do not want harm to come to you. I do not want harm to come to you. Please do not pursue me anymore. And Saul goes, David, you're right. You've been an honorable man. You are good. Forgive me. And so we have these two examples. And what David was trying to do was trying to live up to it. And here's what I want you to understand about David. And he gave us a wonderful example is this. He says, guess what? You will never feel guilty or shame for doing the right thing. Now let me say that again. You will never feel guilty or shame for doing the right thing. Not one of those times that David spared Saul and he could have regained his reputation and he gave mercy and he gave grace. Never once did David have remorse or regret over those decisions. But now if you look at Saul, I can tell you what, he was haunted by those. He regretted those decisions. He regretted them every time. And how many of us can identify with Saul? How many times have we felt guilt? Have we felt shame? And how many times have we tried to wash that off with our hands and it doesn't come off? It only comes off with the blood of Christ. And for you see, that's the lesson I believe God is trying to teach us today. And that's the lesson for us to follow that example is saying what happens when we do have a decision to where we do experience guilt and shame, to where we have cut in corner, to where we haven't told the whole truth, to where we've compromised by trying to keep the thing that we thought mattered to most, to where we squeeze that roll so hard that it literally became mush in our hands because we thought that was the thing that mattered most to us. And yet, that's what Jesus came to do for the person that has done that, for the person that has guilt and remorse and shame and regret, he died for us. He died for that kind of person. And he wants us to live up to it, what it means to living in the kingdom. He says, there's a better way to live. He's saying, I don't want you to have to walk down that path that Saul walked down, where there is much regret and much sorrow he goes, I want you to walk David's path. And the way you can walk David's path is the way Jesus provided for us. He's saying, I love you guys so much 
that it came. I died on the cross for the forgiveness of your sins. I was placed in the tomb, and three days later, according to Scripture, I rose again. And that message gives us hope because what Jesus says is saying, all that guilt, all that shame, that's on me, not on you. And you're forgiven. And now you have the power to live in victory. You don't have to live in fear of sin and death no more. And I love that part because that was a victorious life. And David was far from perfect. He did make mistakes. They did cost him his kingdom. We'll talk about that later on in the future. But I want you to see he did give us an example of what it was like living up to that standard, that we have a currency of grace, of forgiveness, of love. And it's amazing when we actually do that as a people group. And so some of you might say, hey, what do I need to do? What I tell you what you need to do is believe in the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And that guilt and that shame goes away saying, Jesus, I I have put something at the center of my life and I I forgive me and now you need to be put in the center. And all of a sudden, you will see how your life is radically changed. And so I encourage you to do that today if you haven't. And if you have, I encourage you to continue to live as David did. Is when you have an example of when you have an opportunity to get even, you give mercy and grace. When you have an opportunity to step out and to take it matters into your own hands, you give it back to God. And those are the hard things because that requires us to live by faith not by sight. And so today, I just again want to encourage you to remember, it's not about having to have it. It's about living up to it. Amen? Let us pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, again, we thank you so much for just the believing body that we get to minister to. Lord, I pray that they are continue inspired and encouraged by your spirit. Lord, I pray that they experience your presence like they never have. Father, I also pray that your spirit again touch them, heals, heal them in a powerful way that they can testify of your healing hand and your power. Lord, we thank you for the good news in which you've entrusted to us. Help us to continue to share that with our families and continue to grow us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Hope you enjoyed the worship this morning. It was a joy to sing it to you as you sing with us in your home, the comfort of your home. Being comfortable there, we want to also lift up uh, our country, uh, the president, those in office. They need the prayers from all of us going through, uh, the police department, the fire department, all of them through our country, together, we hope in prayer that we'll provide the protection for them and lead our country back into uh, one, under one God. We just thank you that um, we can be able to do this for our country and our neighbors as we worship you, Lord. With that, Jesus, we just thank you that we have the opportunity to worship you in the comforts of our home, but still be together as a family. We just thank you through all of this that we want to say, may God give you hope and joy in believing in the Holy Spirit as he amends in you with hope. Amen.